the experiential opportunities that we're going to offer are as close to real life as it gets. And by that, I mean, with a very generous support of the PTUN Network Challenge, Sean and I will be able to work with local public and private partners and allow students to work with these organizations for a period of time. Students will literally be embedded in these organizations. Now, students are not going to be parachuted in a professional and unfamiliar environment. So that could be quite overwhelming, especially for the youngest ones. Prior to the experiential term, we will leverage existing traditional curricular formats to provide students with the necessary tools to gain the most from their experience, but also to offer the most to their host organization. And we see the benefit as being enjoyed by both parties, students on one hand, but host organizations on the other. This is really the two-way process that underpins our work. We are fortunate that William & Mary has a record of serving underrepresented and underprivileged populations, and these efforts have been intensified in the last few years. We have already identified a number of internal and external organizations active in the diversity and inclusion space who will support us in our outreach to students and particularly minority women who are underrepresented in the cybersecurity field. We plan to liaise with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the local and the student chapter, where we have some direct contacts to leverage the reach of their programs focused on educational advancement opportunities for underprivileged youth in high schools and underrepresented college students. Additionally, we are collaborating with a coordinator for the family and community engagement of our local school district. Also, we have gained the support of school board members from the local and surrounding school districts who are focused on developing educational programs and career opportunities for high achieving low income students. We have connections for outreach with the established diversity and inclusion focused entities at the college level, as well as in the Mason School of Business, schools of education, arts and sciences and law. We'll also leverage programs designed to support first-generation college students, as well as the William & Mary Scholars Undergraduate Research Experience Program for recruitment. We seek to engage with those initiatives and groups on campus that support efforts for developing scholarship of underprivileged, underrepresented, and or marginalized groups. For example, the William & Mary Lemon Project, named after a man enslaved by William & Mary, is a funded initiative supported by the Board of Visitors that attempts in a multifaceted and dynamic way to rectify wrongs perpetrated against African-Americans involving William & Mary through action or inaction. Lemon stands in the place of the known and unknown African-Americans who helped to build, maintain, and move the university forward. Other groups helpful for reaching underprivileged populations are, for example, the Latin Student Union and the William and Mary Brafferton Legacy Group, an organization focused on Native American education and civic engagement, which continue, continues these efforts of the Brafferton Indian School that operated at William and Mary in the 1700s. We hope our initiative will augment the aforementioned efforts across the William and Mary community and strengthen its ties to the local community. If we were able not only to place high school and college students from underprivileged backgrounds in these experiential offerings, but if this could also shape their future careers, this would be our ultimate hope for our initiative. What a beautiful question that is. This is part of what we hope to determine with potential future longitudinal studies. So in this moment, I can only answer with an educated guess, um, which is interdisciplinary education. Now I would repeat that three times, but my tongue would get tied. So one will have to suffice. Right now there is a huge demand for candidates with strong cybersecurity skills. And when the market is so hot, there are salary wars to snap up the most competent candidates candidates. 
In practice, this means that many of the brightest and most promising candidates move to the private sector where public interest technology is not necessarily a priority. Now, obviously, I am generalizing, but high salary demands high revenues, which often drive for profit organizations. But profit and public interest are not mutually exclusive. Over the last two decades, we've seen the growth of strong corporate social responsibilities movements, and more recently, the strengthening of the discourse surrounding ESG criteria, environmental, societal, and governance. And that's where public interest technology is going to be a game changer. The next generation of cybersecurity professionals that we're hoping to shape, and what a privilege that is, is more attuned to ESG criteria than mine was. They want to advance, they want to create, innovate, but not at all costs, or rather, not at the costs that my generation was willing to incur. If we can help them to see issues from a more rounded perspective, rather than the siloed one of a narrow professional lens, then we may just have a shot at opening the professional doors to talented, ambitious cybersecurity professionals who want to use their skills to also serve the public good. How do we do that? By helping this next generation of cybersecurity professionals look at cybersecurity problems from a multitude of different perspectives. There are technical factors, of course, but there are also human, commercial, legal, ethical, political factors that they need to become familiar with. So this is what we do in our interdisciplinary course that we actually teach William and Mary to students across campus, both graduate and undergrad students. And this will form the backbone of the preparation that we'll provide to the students who will be selected for these experiential opportunities. say that there are two ways in which we aim to support the network in advancing the field. First, as I said, we will engage underrepresented communities and students in experiential opportunities. Second, we will support local, private, and public organizations to protect basic operations and serve a greater customer base. As I noted, this is a two-way process, which means that the benefits are felt by the students and host organizations. Look at it this way. Experiential learning will expose students to practical challenges and will allow them to develop and use skill sets in the context of real life needs. This in turn provides partner organizations with a talent pool. And these organizations are also looking to underrepresented groups of which minority women are the most absent. Women comprise 25% of the U.S. information technology workforce and less than 20% in the cybersecurity workforce, which lower representation of African Americans and Hispanics exists. Success for raising cybersecurity awareness will be assessed in three ways. First, the number of minority students that we will be able to recruit to the experiential opportunities. Two, the feedback shared by partner organizations on the student's performance, effective communication, ability to understand what contributes to cyber risk reduction. And three, self-reflective review by the students assessing the insight gained on cybersecurity, such as cyber risk assessment and understanding cyber-oriented methods and indicators for mis- and disinformation. All of these are valuable qualitative data points that can shape future research. to guess, I would say that because our work is directed to college and college-bound students, we're not likely to see broad systemic changes in two years from now. However, learnings from the ripple effects of the pandemic, the unpredictable natural disasters, and the renewed discourse about the fragility of democracy will hopefully in five years' time bring small but significant increases in interest in technology for the public good. Maybe we'll also see more readily accessible courses across the national college curricular, engaging students in asking and perhaps answering some of these difficult questions. In continuing with this optimistic trend, I hope that in 10 years time, public interest technology is a mainstream term and an ambition for the next generation of cyber professionals. I also look at my children 
and their peers and how they relate to issues like social justice, environmental protection and mis and disinformation. And I have hope. Iria and I are certainly dedicated to do our part to bring greater opportunities to significantly underrepresented minorities, particularly the cybersecurity industry servicing all sectors.